Welcome to the Metal Prognosis, my name is Lee, and today we have a little bit of a Christmas special type of thing that I haven't done before, but we're going to talk about burnout. So it's a little bit more of a discussion video, a little bit more like a podcast type of style. Uh, I'm going to highlight some things that I've experienced with burnout, but also give a little bit of a positive twist too on how, how I like to try and work through it. And yeah, then we can kind of have a discussion about it, have a talk and see what inspires you and what you can share as well. So cue the cute little cartoon intro and let's get chatting. So as I run through this list, uh, my stutter is a little bit bad today, so let's see how we go through this. So when we talk about burnout, it is a, a long list of, of possibilities that could cause you to burn out and really move yourself away from a project. Um, so whether you're an engineer or a muso, uh, it doesn't really matter, it, it, it happens to all of us. But the first thing that came to mind when it comes to being burnt out in a studio is lack of progression. When you're not progressing through the project that you're actually working on. Um, which it could be for uh, uh, multiple causes. And uh, for me personally, uh, the main cause would be um, other musicians. Now that's not having a go at other musicians saying they're not as passionate or not as committed to, to myself or anything like that. The main reason is we're all busy. We're all adults and we've all got other things to help us earn money to be able to do this passion and to keep it going. So scheduling, Friggin' hard. It is. It's a challenge within itself. Um, for example, the uh, vocalist, one of the vocals I'm working with at the moment, is a shift worker. So when I've had a few weekends available to, to just do studio work and get stuck into our project, they've been working really hard at their work. So I can't get upset at them, and I'm definitely not upset at them. But it can get very frustrating due to the situation. The, the, the projects in because we can't push forward. I've got it to a point where it's like, all right, now I need vocals to step in. Um, so the remedy to that that I've been trying to work with and do is um, there's always other projects you can do, other things you can do in the background. So working on other tunes, other demos to, to present to them so when they are ready, because when they, the vocals are ready, the floodgates could potentially open up and then suddenly you've got a huge amount of um, amazing material that you can work with and creative um, magic that's just you know, blooming and, and shining everywhere. Uh, and also, one thing I really try to remind myself when I do get myself in a little bit of an emotional rut, when it's not, something isn't progressing, uh, that's out of my control. Because, uh, uh, for example, if I could sing say for example black metal because I love black metal vocals I could do a bunch of projects just by myself I wouldn't just limit it to that because I love work with other other people and other vocalists especially um, and drummers it can really bring different characteristics and things to life to the guitaring and other things that I compose and write but it, for example if I could do black metal then it's like if all these delays are happening uh, with this vocalist that I'm working with I could go do my black metal project and do that as a one one person band, no problem at all. Uh, but since I don't have that, it's like, all right, I've got to think about what is going to make me passionate to come back into the studio. What's going to bring that spark, even if it can't be working with this, uh, this vocalist for the part that they need to do. And it could be, as I said, with anything drums, bass, if you're not a guitarist or you're working with other guitarists or whatever the scenario might be, when you're stuck in that rut waiting for other people, what can you do to bring back that spark? Now, as an engineer and guitarist, I could work on guitar tones. No one gives a shit about guitar tones more than the actual guitarist. So, investing the time and studio um, energy and force to really try different stuff with the guitar tones is a perfect time while you're waiting for another musician to come. You can get hyped and really nerd it the fuck out without having to uh, worry about dragging anyone else through that um, that might not be as uh, keen as what you would be. I think it's the best way to put it. So get all your pedals, get all your different amp heads, run the dry ones, re re-amping or re-record them, do however you need to do to, to help do that. Now, I know it's best if you've already got the drums, the bass, uh, and vocalist, this is from a guitarist perspective, or even if you're, you're a bass player, to have all 
the other elements but one. So when you can start mixing, you can see, all right, what's gonna work and blend best with this? Um, sometimes you don't have that option. For example, the one I'm giving right now. So doing that could be really, really cool to help spark that and get you excited about these songs again and bring it there. So when the vocalist does come back or the bass player or whomever is missing, you've got this extra uh, tier of quality uh, that the song is at by that time. That's friggin' awesome. That is a real, real good way. I also spent a bit of time um, with my situation with the vocalist that I'm working with when there was a, a, you know, a decent amount of period where we couldn't work together because of work uh, timetable clashes, is I worked on how to actually capture guitars because I fell into a trap where I didn't know the best way on how to capture the actual guitar. Uh, so I figured that out and that turned out to be really, really cool. So that helped spark uh, my passion and that towards these songs we were working on. So I was like, wow, cool. Here is a solid way that I can do it that's really in tune with itself and you get a, a great quality at the end without much phasing issues or um, too much overlay problems where it just becomes overly muddy for the style and, and the way that I play. So that was something I brought to it that was really cool. And I haven't done the reamp thing yet. So I've got them all dry. It's actually set up the session behind me. I've got them all dry. So if things do get delayed a little bit more, that's my next step. Reamp it, bring it back out, and I can start mucking around and nerd my little music metal heart out with all this stuff uh, to see what I want to really bring um, to the songs and see how much I can really take them. And I've got the time to do it. So the other thing, now let's move on to the other thing. Uh, these are a little bit longish, but it's a discussion. That's what we're doing. And what a way to spend your Christmas day but listen to me ramble and hopefully you're verbalizing, talking back to me as I'm doing, because I hope you are, because that's what I do in a lot of videos that I watch and listen to as well. <laughs> it's wishful thinking, but you know, hopefully there's some um, Christmas um, magic there to help make that happen. Uh, one thing I really talk about a lot with other musicians I deal with and engineers in real life is a thing that I call too many hats. A lot of time burnout happens when you have too many hats on. Now that's a metaphorical uh, way of saying you've, you're doing too many roles and too many things at once. And this happens in all workplaces really, but it's definitely no exception in the studio. If you're a guitarist and an engineer, uh, as an example, which one are you focusing on while you're tracking? Can you take a hat off to go, all right, I'm thinking as an engineer, then is your guitaring taking a little bit of a step back or a sideway uh, step? Or vice versa, are you thinking too much of a guitarist and not from an engineering perspective? And there's a point where um, I super, super struggle with it and I have for many, many years and I'm still trying to work on how to get through it. And I felt like um, the, the couple of times I have worked with a producer, it's awesome uh, because they know when to say, that's good. Where me, when I'm having both hats on, I find it really hard to let myself know, saying, hey, that's a really good take. You can move on to the next section because I want to get it better and better and tighter and cleaner and really get those characteristics shining and every little moment and minute thing I'm doing, I want it to be as you know perfect as I possibly can get it for whatever the project needs. And I fall into the trap because I tested it one time where I recorded and I was like, I'm not sure about that, but I'm gonna keep it. Did it again, not sure about that, but I'm gonna keep it. And I did it about five times, five or six times. Then I listened to them all back. And then I thought, I could put down, doesn't matter what amount of money, $100, $1,000 or even more, that anyone that wants to listen to these tracks couldn't tell the difference between them all. So what the hell am I doing? <laughs> When you're at that point, and that's, a, that's a, another prime example of it being a burnout when you're wearing too many hats because you don't know when it's time to stop. You don't know when it's time to actually take that step back and go, all right, time to progress forward. And suddenly something that could have taken you a couple of hours may have taken you two, three days, if not even longer. Um, and that's not healthy. It's not good. It's not good at all. And also to elaborate on that as well as kind of a, um, a thickening up the actual plot, as an engineer, 
I find it a lot easier dealing with guitarists um, talking them through things, which is very hypocritical of me because I can't do it to myself, and I admit that openly. Dealing with other guitarists, it's so much easier for me to talk through them, to let them know which ones are good, which ones haven't quite got it yet for whatever reason, and how what we need to do to really shift it and shape it to make it go on the right path to get to where we need to go. And to give them some reassurance as well to go, look, that sounds brutal, that sounds really cool, that is exactly what you're going for. Let's listen back again to make sure that you're happy with it, because everyone needs to be happy with it. Uh, last thing you want to do is record a musician and they go, no, I'm not quite happy with that, and you try to convince them to move on because they, they need to live with that song uh, for a hell of a lot longer than what you do. That's theirs for life. You're going to move on to other projects and all that. Very important little side note there. <laughs> uh, but I found it easy to do that, to be able to talk them through it, confirm it, and to move on and make sure they're happy, I'm happy, we've captured the exact right thing and we're not getting caught into... Um, you know, the, the, and this is absolutely no exaggeration at all, when we're moving into the 70th or 80th take for that one section, trying to get all those things. Um, so that's definitely something that can be burnt out. So one of the remedies that I tried to do was, as I said before, did a few takes and then tested myself to go, what is the actual difference with these? What parts of these once I finish recording it and push the um, unenable button to say, nah, I'm not quite happy or comfortable with that fully. It's one of, it's like, um, you know, taking a step away and then coming back with fresher ears and fresher approach to it. Um, so now I'm a lot more um, lenient with myself, I think it is. So how I've decided to come along with this last project is firstly I decided I'm not quad tracking because the, the characteristics of my guitar I want, quad tracking doesn't really give me that final result on how I like to track and then mix things afterwards. Two or three tracks is really good for me and what I got into the habit of doing is going through until I wasn't happy stopping there, keeping what I got, and then just picking it up from there on. And not moving on from that one section until I've got one file, so to speak, or one little block section that I'm happy with, and then I'll move on. Instead of having the 10 to 20 to 30 different ones until they suddenly all come in you know, to fruition, hopefully. So this way I feel like it's more guaranteed, it's more efficient, it's more quicker, it's more precise, and I'm a lot more happier because I get through songs a lot quicker, uh, which once again brings that progress uh, progression back into uh, how you're doing your project. Um, so now moving on to the, another thing about burning out. This isn't really burning out, so to speak, but it's more of a preventive mind frame to have. So one of the biggest questions I, I always ask myself or, or check when I'm working on projects is, is there a contract involved? Is there any you know, sponsorships or endorsements to this project? If there is, cool, that's awesome. What is the time schedule for it? Not what schedule you've made for yourself, not what time schedule you want, what is legally bounding your time frame that you need to um, comply to? Because sometimes, uh, actually a lot of the times, there is none at all. Uh, so both sponsorships and endorsements don't have much of a time frame to it, if at all. So why are you rushing yourself? Why are you giving yourself these um, bizarre time schedules that you want to really stick to? Now, scheduling is really good. I am super fussy with booking things in and um, even how I run my social life, I think about hanging out with friends as booking out a spot, like it's my studio time or anything like that, because that's just how my mind works and that's how I get through things. Um, and when it comes to the studio, it's like, if you come into a studio on one day going, all right, cool, we are doing all bass. We have got three songs for this EP or whatever, five songs. So for today, I want to get three songs done. You're going to not have a good time. You're just not. If you do, wow, you're going to get a euphoria moment to go, that was brilliant, look how much we did. 
but there's a good chance the stress and the compromises are gonna start coming in that aren't needed. Because some of the base takes might not be good enough. They might not hit the mark. Something might be slightly out of tune, but you're gonna justify it to yourself going, oh, but it's in tune enough because I wanna get through these three songs. Why? Why do you have to get through those three songs? So it's definitely worth asking yourself those things. We do this as a passion. We wanna give as much energy and characteristics as much as our own personality into all these instruments and all these takes that we do. So when it's all combined with all the musics together and we share it out to the world, this is the best characteristics that we're presenting in our song or our songs. Why would we just, why would we jeopardize that? Because we made up a timeline that doesn't really exist. Why? And I've dealt with plenty of musos and other producers that have all those. If you're hiring studio time, that's different because that treat that as a contract. Even though it might not be written down if you're just hiring studio time to actually record you, that is a contract. That's how much time you got, so you work within that. But if you're not, um, take your time. Have the bass player come in, do what they can do naturally. Most of the time, I've experienced, if you don't pressure them, and this isn't just restricted to bass players, this is any musician. I was just using a bass player as an example. <laughs> uh, if you don't put the pressure on them, they're gonna perform better and they might get through more because stress causes um, muscle tension, over analyzation, and while you're playing, you've got that pressure and you've got that, um, what's it called? Red light fever, where the red recording light is on. I'll put it up there because the old studios used to have the you know, live on air thing and all that. No, but the, it's really in the studio when the red recording button's on. People forget things. Musos forget everything. They might have been practiced like crazy for a few weeks. Get that red light on. Blank. They will just forget. <laughs> or they might put themselves into a worse position to go, hey, I'm gonna do this as a one take. Give me a live take. And then something might be slightly late or slightly early, or um, as I said before, slightly out of tune. A note might be bent just a little bit too less or a little bit too much. And you're gonna start compromising and wrongly, trying to just get through it all. And it's not good for the actual song and for what you're doing. And you're putting that pressure on and you don't need it. It's not worth it. Especially when you're home recording, don't do it. Give yourself a reasonable amount of time, if not no time, and just see how organically it takes. If you have the passion, if you have the energy, and if you have um, the right surroundings and vibe to get the creative juices flowing, it's gonna work out for the best. It absolutely will. But if you start forcing stuff, then you're gonna start seeing trouble. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about burnout um, is kind of start on a, on a bit of a positive note, where if you've experienced any of this before, I definitely have, because I've shared all this, and a hell of a lot more. Uh, I could do a you know, 98 hour uh, video about all the different studio stuff and burnouts and problems and this and that that I've learned and, and worked through and all that. It's, yeah, I'm sure most of us could. But as a final note, um, Think about every little step that you've made and all these little hiccups and trip ups you've had and times you stepped into puzzles when you, you know, could have been prevented. Um, they're all steps towards better things. So don't ever feel bad going, oh fuck, I did that. Um, or, oh, oh, you know, I just did that now or I'm working on this right now, which is wrong. And now I can see how things are unfolding in a not fluent and smooth way. Um, it's still fine because you learn from this and you grow from this and next projects you do you start thinking about all that stuff again and how to start preventing that and having a more positive attitude and getting more a positive result and that's what we want we want to be happier with our things we want to be more stress-free we want to be mentally more healthy and we want to get a result that we're super excited about not just the end result but the whole journey to get to it because how many projects have we heard about um, through very successful bands or our own bands that we worked with where it's like, that was a fucking nightmare and I can't believe we got it done. And as much as I love hearing it, there's part of me that doesn't like hearing it because of all these little niggly things or all this other stuff or this reminds me of things that happened there that weren't that good for whatever reasons they might be. Um, 
So yeah, every issue that we've had, we learn from it and we move on and we become wiser and we become better. And I honestly believe in absolute all truth, this whole video has been all about truth, but just to home in on a little bit more, um, a lot of the time, unfortunately, the best way to learn is to screw up. It sucks. None of us want to screw up ever, at all, any time, whether it's paid work or non-paid work or passion or hobby or something that you want to turn into a um, paying career. Sometimes that is the best lessons. And we need to embrace that and go, wow, yeah, that was shit, but look where we are now and look where we can get after that and look how much higher we can fly now. And hopefully you can have a really positive attitude and go, look at us laugh about what we did back then and all that. Because <laughs> that's healthy too. So thank you very much for joining me on this little um, chat. Uh, I think burnout is a very important thing to talk about. And yeah, if this video goes well and it gets enough discussions and enough views, um, yeah, I'll definitely do more and point out other things and all that of issues that I've come across at the studio or friends that might want to share their things that they've had to the studio and, and give some issues and remedies to help as well. So we're dealing with a bit of both, a bit of sharing some bad, but some good, because it's all about lifting people up, not punching down, always. So yeah, love to continue this conversation with you all. Thank you very much. Share this video with anyone who you think like this type of uh, talking narration um, lecture. Not in a bad way, lecture, not like you're in trouble. No, it isn't like a university type of lecture. Um, videos and yeah I look forward to chatting with you next time and until then stay safe